I'm going to start with a story from my freshman year in college. So the summer right after I graduated from high school, uh, I got on a bus the night I graduated and set off on tour with a, a Christian singing group that toured the United States. And uh, on that tour, I had an experience where I received a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I received the gift of speaking in tongues. And a month after that experience, I arrived at my Christian college. I show up this freshly filled, on fire, young Pentecostal. And the only problem is that my college didn't believe in any of that. My college, this Christian college, was cessationist in theology. Do you know what that means? That means they believed that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all that stuff ceased when the apostles died. And uh, so here I was, you know, I'm like a fish out of water at this place. Well, uh, fast forward a few months, we get to the spring, and somehow I got invited to be on the Inspiration Week committee. And Inspiration Week was this whole week set aside where, I mean, we did our classes and everything, but we had special chapels, and we invited a guest speaker. And uh, so in the committee meeting, I suggested that we invite Pastor Wendell Wallace as a guest speaker. And Wendell was this dynamic speaker, led a multi-ethnic church, multi-generational church in Portland, Oregon, attracted lots and lots of young people, fabulous guy. And uh, whenever I could, uh, I would gather some friends and we'd get up early on a Sunday morning and drive from Eugene up to Portland to go to Maranatha and hear Wendell preach. Now, needless to say, Wendell was also a flaming Pentecostal, even more flaming than me. And uh, I never, when I suggested him, I never dreamed they would say yes, that they'd invite him, but they did. And he came, and I want to tell you, he lit a fire on our campus. I wish you could have been there. For one of the chapel services, he asked all of us students uh, to bring corded appliances, you know, things that require electricity, and set them on stage. So when we showed up that morning for chapel, the whole stage all across the front was littered with, you know, with things like this. And uh, then his text was 1 Kings chapter 18. It's the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And you might remember that there was this big confrontation up on Mount Carmel, and uh, the prophets of Baal, they built their altar, and uh, the, the deal was they're each going to build an altar, put a sacrifice, and the God that answered with fire, that's the real God. So the prophets of Baal, they, they build their altar, they put their cow there, you know, they dance around, they cut themselves, they pray. It goes on all day. Nothing happens. And Elijah, by the way, makes fun of them, says, maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's on vacation. He's mocking them. Well, finally, they're worn out. Elijah comes over here. He builds an altar, you know, puts the wood, puts the cow on, and then he pours water on it just to show. There's no trickery going on here. He just soaks the whole thing with water, and then he prays, and he says, God, let the fire fall. Send the fire. And boom, down it comes. And so this was the theme of his talk, and his, his title was Let the Fire Fall. And it was all about how we need the power of God in our lives if we're going to do the work of God. It was a great message. So when he gets to these things, right, he's wanting to make the point that we need power. And one by one, he'd hold different appliances up, and he'd say, what is this? What does it do? And what does it need? And so he'd hold up something like this. He'd say, what is this? A hair dryer. What's a hair dryer do? It dries hair, but what does it need to dry hair? It needs power. Let the fire fall. And then he'd go to the next thing, right? And he'd grab the next one. And he'd say, what's this? A toaster. What's a toaster do? It toasts bread, but what does it need to toast bread? It needs power. Let the fire fall. And then he'd go to the next thing. And he'd say, what's this? Anybody know what this is? Ah, see, I got you, huh? Clock radio. You know what this is? A clock face, yes. <laughs> Non-digital. This is the actual thing we would have had back then. He'd say, what's this? And they'd say, a radio. What's a radio do? What do yeah, see, a lot of you are going, I have no clue what a radio does. Yeah. <laughs> Plays music, but what does it need? Power. Power. Let the fire fall. Oh, he brought the thunder. I'm telling you. And he got to the end. This was awesome. He got to the end, and he invited all of us to come to the altar and invite the Holy Spirit to fill us in a fresh way with his power. And students, hundreds of us, flooded the altar, and he was praying for us. All these kids have their hands up. They're receiving this fresh infilling from the Holy Spirit, and all the faculty standing on the back going, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, for weeks after this, 
students and faculty alike debated this experience. And folks tended to fall on one side or the other. There were a whole bunch of folks who dismissed the whole experience as nothing but emotionalism and said, you know what we really need is not that kind of stuff. What we really need is the fruit of the Spirit. We need proven character. That's what we need. On the other side, there were a whole bunch of people who said, no, that was, that was a real experience. The Holy Spirit touched us. And we need the power of the Spirit to do God's work. The gifts and the power or the fruit. So who was right? I was. Yes. <laughs> That's what my wife says. My love language, honey, what is it? Being right. That's right. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, a lot of you said the right thing. Yeah. Who was right? The answer is... Both, yeah, because this is not an either or. It's not either the gifts or the fruit. It's both and. We need both the power and the character. And that's the big idea for this talk. There at the top of your outline, there's an outline there on the handout you got. It's not either or, but both and. We need both the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, both the power of the Spirit and the character of the Spirit. So this is week two of this series, Are You Gifted? It's a series of talks on the gifts of the Spirit. And last week, Pastor Michael told us that every one of us have both natural gifts and spiritual gifts that God has given us to do His work and to serve others. All of us are gifted. And we're going to continue over the next few weeks coming up to unpack the gifts and learn what we can about them. But this week, Pastor Michael asked me to talk with you about the fruit of the Spirit, how the Holy Spirit not only gifts us for service, but grows the character of Jesus within us, and we desperately need both. So we're going to look today at a text in Galatians chapter 5. This is the time to pass those Bibles down the aisle, would you? Go ahead, pass the Bibles down the aisle. Make sure everyone gets a Bible and turn to page 1004, 1004, Galatians 5. We're going to start at verse 16. While you're turning there, let me just tell you, if you look at your outline, you'll notice that uh, there's two things in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this passage very quickly. And then I have two things I want to share with you, one and two in your outline. And then we're going to finish by singing a song and offering a prayer together and just taking a few moments to let God touch us. All right, Galatians chapter 5, we'll start at verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. All right, let's pause there for just a moment. Paul describes a conflict here that I think all of us are familiar with. The conflict between our flesh, that is our our human nature, our sinful nature, and the Spirit of God who's living within us. Now, when Paul uses the word flesh, he's using it in a very specific way here. He's not talking about this stuff. He's not talking about our our flesh and bones, our physical bodies, but he's talking about our human nature, and particularly our human nature in rebellion against God. Flesh is me without God. Flesh is me living in rebellion against God. Flesh is, simply put, selfish me, capital F, capital M. That's what flesh is, selfish me. My sinful nature desires what is contrary to God's Spirit. Said another way, my sinful nature has some evil desires within it. And in verse 17, he says this interesting thing. He says, so you are not to do whatever you want. Or some translations say, so you do not do what you want to do. And this could mean one of two things. It could mean that our sinful nature keeps us from doing the good we want. We want to do something good, but we have this battle inside us and we don't get it done. Or flipped around, it could mean that the Holy Spirit living within us keeps us from doing the evil that we want. Or it could be both. It could be both, most likely. So here's this conflict. I want to do the right thing. There's also this tug to the dark side. Sometimes I want to do the wrong thing, and I feel the restraining presence of the Holy Spirit pulling me back. How many of you have felt this tug of war going on inside? Okay. If your hands are not up, you're not self-aware. Sorry. Because it's there inside every one of us. Paul describes it more fully in Romans chapter 7. So what are we supposed to do about this tug of war? Well, he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Hold that thought. Walk in the Spirit. We're going to come back to it. All right? Now, Paul wants to be crystal clear 
about the differences between these two realms. And so he's going to spell them out. Here's what the flesh does. Here's what the Spirit produces. So verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whew. What a list, huh? Paul says, listen, just in case you're not clear what I'm talking about when I say that we have bad desires in our, in our human nature, he says, let me, be, let me just spell it out for you. And he <laughs> lays out this list, says, this is what our human sinful nature does. Left to ourselves, apart from God, this is what sinful me produces. It's ugly, and Paul warns us, those who live this way won't inherit the kingdom of God. But thankfully, that's not our only option. And Paul goes on to describe life in the Spirit. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. All right, so first he gives this list, verses 19 to 21. Here's what selfish me does. Here are the acts of the sinful, selfish person. But then he contrasts that. Here's what God does when we walk in the Spirit, when we live in the Spirit. The Spirit produces love, joy, peace, forbearance, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Which list would you rather have describe your life? That's frightening. <clears throat> Which list would you rather have describe your life? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully you're all ready to sign up for the second one, right? You want what the, the, that, that good list. Now here, we're going to take a moment. I'm going to have you turn to one other person sitting next to you. And uh, I, I want to just read this list again. And here's what I want you to listen for. Which one of these do you most need in your life right now? Most of us will have one that will jump out at us. Here it is. Love, joy, peace, forbearance. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, kindness. Okay? Turn to your neighbor. you got 60 seconds. Each of you get to pick one. Share with your neighbor. Here's what I need most in my life. Anybody out there sitting next to your spouse and they said, honey, you need all nine of them in spades. I'm just saying. All right, these nine things we could say are the character of Jesus, are they not? This is how Jesus lived and behaved. So these are the things the Spirit grows in us as we walk with Him. Back to our big idea. Do we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to do God's work? The answer is a great big Yes, we do. Do we need the fruit of the Spirit to do God's work? And the answer is yes, we do. And I want to show you how in these last two questions. Here are the two questions. Why is spiritual character important? That's number one. We're going to talk about that. And the second question is how do we grow it? How do we develop that spiritual character? So number one on your outline, why is spiritual character important? And you might be wondering why in a series on spiritual gifts, talking about God's power tools for doing His work, why are we talking about character? What does that have to do with doing God's work? And I want to say that we need God's character to do His work just as badly as we need His power. We need both. And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. First of all, number one, first reason is you lead and serve out of who you are. 
You lead and serve out of who you are. Being precedes doing. Who you are will ultimately shape what you do. And so we must continue to grow our character for everything that we do proceeds out of who we are. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 12, 33. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. All right, so the fruit, he says, depends upon the tree. Make the tree good, and the fruit will be good. So often, we want to focus on the fruit, right? We want to focus on the results. We want to focus on what we do. When Jesus says, first, you got to focus on the tree. Make the tree good. It's all about who you are. You lead and serve out of who you are. So years ago, I had a young man, very talented young man, very charismatic young man, come to me after a service, and he asked me what he needed to do to become a pastor. Well, I'd known this, this young man for a while. And I said, well, I'm going to encourage you to grow some things in your character. And I actually listed some things that I thought were lacking in his character. What I was telling him was, make the tree good, right? Make the tree good because you lead out of who you are. And I told him that while his gifts could take him a long way, his character flaws could also undermine his effectiveness and reduce his influence. I gave him some things to work on. And we coached him. And eventually, I hired him. Unfortunately, a couple years later, we let him go. And here's why I let him go. I said he was very gifted, and he attracted young leaders like crazy. But he couldn't keep them. Why couldn't he keep them? Because after working with them for a while, he'd wear them out. He didn't follow through on what he said he was going to do. He didn't show up for meetings. He struggled to get along with other people. Listen, friends, it wasn't a matter of competence. He had plenty of competence, very gifted. It was a matter of what? Of character. Make the tree good, Jesus said. You lead and serve out of who you are. Let me say it this way. You might want to write this down. Character trumps competence. Character trumps competence. I'm going to illustrate that for you right now, all right? So for years here at Life Center, we've had a matrix that we use for hiring, the four C's. And the first C, we'll put them up on the screen for you here. The first C is calling. Is Jesus calling you to do this work? The second C is character. Do you have mature and growing character? Not are you perfect, but do you have solid character? Chemistry, do you play well with others? And then finally, number four, competence. Do you have the needed gifts and skills? Can you do the job? And you'll notice that calling is first, right? This is a, if you're going to work on a church staff, you've got to be called. If you're not called, if you don't have a sense that Jesus wants me to do this, friends, this is hard, and I promise you, you will wear out quickly. You won't love it. But after calling, the top thing we look for is character. And this surprises people, because in the business world, what's the top thing you look for? Competence, Right? We're looking for people that are really gifted, really skilled, that can do the job. But here, we, the first thing we look for is character, because we believe you lead out of who you are. Let me put it in really theological terms for you. If you were a butthead, it doesn't matter how competent you are. <laughs> right? It just doesn't matter. Most people who fail in ministry do so because of unaddressed character issues. Make the tree good, Jesus said. Then the next thing is chemistry. If you can't get along with people, no one's going to want to work with you. It doesn't matter how competent you are. Last weekend, you got to meet Anthony and Edwina Wanaina, and you also got to meet Jim and Masako Millard. We have a picture of the Millard family here. Uh, Jim and Masako, longtime missionaries to Japan. They started there 40 years ago, just the two of them. Now I think they have 22 adult missionaries in their organization. And over lunch, we were talking about all these new missionaries working and Jim made a quiet comment. He said, most missionaries who come to Japan don't last past their first term. It's, he says, it's very, very difficult. And I asked him, well, why is that? And Jim said, well, there are lots of reasons, but there's one reason above all the others. Want to know what it is? It'll surprise you. They can't get along with the other missionaries. It's chemistry. They don't play well with others. And that undermines, not a matter of competence, gifted, skilled, smart, got all that, chemistry. So we look for character first, chemistry second, and then, to many people's surprise, competence is the last thing, the gifts and skills to get the job done. Now, am I saying that competence is unimportant? Absolutely not. Of course it's important. But again, it's not either or, it is both and. 
Of course we want competence, but good fruit comes from a good tree. Jesus said, make the tree good. I'm going to give you a character-based definition of success. Every now and then, once in a while, I say something really good, and I always like to warn you ahead of time. Here it comes. So get your pens ready and write this down. Success. Success is when those who know me best love and respect me most. That's a character-based definition of success. When those who know me best love and respect me most. You will only experience that kind of success with character when you lead and serve out of who you are, all right? That's why character is important. Here's a second reason why character is important, real quickly. Second, your gifts can take you farther than your character can sustain. Your gifts can take you farther than your character can sustain. There is no immediate correlation between talent and maturity. You can be uber talented and still be very immature. And we get into trouble when the momentum of our talent takes us past the maturity of our character. So we must be intentional about developing the inner person. I'm going to give you just a real quick example of this. I'll say two names, very well-known Christian leaders, spiritual leaders, Billy Graham. You all know Billy Graham? Mark Driscoll. Okay? Each of these very gifted leaders, each of them led huge organizations, each of them great communicators with proven effectiveness, but very, very different outcomes. Why? Character. One conducted himself with consistency and integrity for a lifetime, while the other was accused of spiritual abuse that ultimately shut down his entire church. Why is character important? Because nothing will reduce your influence more quickly or more deeply than a character deficiency. If you want to expand your influence, deepen your character. Or in the words of Jesus, make the tree good. So how do we do that? That's number two on the outline. Here's the last thing we're going to talk about. How do we make the tree good? How do I grow spiritual character? How do we do it? Everyone doing okay? See, I mean, this is, we're at point two already, folks. The landing gear is out. <laughs> How do I grow spiritual character? Now, let me just say, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify this because character development involves lots of different things. And we could, talk about, we could talk about counseling or therapy to address the issues from your family of origin. We could talk about spiritual disciplines, things like PBJ that we use. We could talk about our friendships and developing personal accountability. We could talk about living in community. We could talk about developing emotional health and growing self-awareness. All these things and many others, all of them important. But today I'm confining myself specifically to this text in Galatians 5, and it tells us that it's the Holy Spirit who produces fruit in us. That the character of Jesus, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these things are the work of the Spirit in our lives. And if we want them in abundance, he says we need to walk in the Spirit. So do you have your Bible still open there to Galatians 5? Okay. If you don't, open them back up because we're going to look again at uh, three verses. And I want you to notice the verbs in these verses. They tell us what to do. Galatians 5.16, the Apostle Paul says, so I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by, with, or in the Spirit. And the word walk here, it's, it's the Greek word that literally means to walk. But it was used uh, of the way you live, of the way you, uh, the way you go about your business, so to speak. And so it's used literally of walking, but it's also used figuratively of your lifestyle. Live your life in the Spirit. And by the way, this word walk has been absorbed into Christianese, hasn't it? And every now and then you'll hear Christians talk and say, hey, how's your walk? And they're not talking about your physical gait, they're talking about your spiritual life. How's your walk with God? So first of all, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. Then look down at verse 18. Paul says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Be led by the Spirit. Now here's another way to look at it. If the Spirit is leading, what are you doing? Following, right, and some translations actually render it that way. Follow the Spirit. So first, walk in the Spirit. Second, follow the Spirit. Then down to verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, that is, since the Holy Spirit has given us life, you're born again, Jesus said, 
by the Holy Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit. Therefore, he says, let's keep in step. And this is a really cool Greek word that means to, to walk in a line, in a row. So picture a, a, a marching column of soldiers, right? All one right after another. Or a, a more uh, closer to home example is uh, uh, some kids playing follow the leader, right? And whatever the one does, everyone's following, keeping in line. That's the picture here. So here are these three verbs, walk in the Spirit, or live in the Spirit, be led by it, or follow the Spirit, and then keep in step with the Spirit. What do all three of these have in common? This, okay, yeah, someone said the Spirit, yeah, okay, besides that. Okay, what? Yeah, I heard someone say, they're all moving, aren't they? Yeah, walk, follow, keep in step, right? They're all moving, good, what else? I'm going to come back to that. What's that? Intention. Yes, good intention. In fact, I want to just kind of expand on that just a little bit. There's, there is engagement with the other person, right? If I were to tell you, uh, hey, come walk with me today, or follow me around today, or keep in step with me, that means that you're going to be with me and engaged with me in relationship all day long, right? And so the first thing I want to say about these, first of all, it's all about relationship. Each of these three words reflects an active engagement with the Holy Spirit. Being a Christian is not just a one-hour Sunday deal. So often we ask people, hey, are you a Christian? And what do they say? Well, I go to church or... I don't go to church, as though that's all it were, we're just this, one hour a week. But this is all day, every day, walking with Jesus, walking in the Spirit. Here's the other cool thing. All three of these verbs, walk, follow, keep in step, are in the present tense. Now, a little bit of grammar, I'm not going to bore you with this, but this is kind of cool. The aorist tense is the past tense, and it refers to things that are kind of one and done, a one-time action. But the present tense refers to things that are ongoing, continuing actions. Keep walking. Keep following. Keep stepping. The change we're looking for doesn't come in a one-and-done deal. It comes from an ongoing relationship. Listen, friends, we would all love it if we could just say yes to Jesus and boom, instant sainthood. Wouldn't that be cool? Have you ever met anyone that happened to? No. We'd all love to microwave our character, and God is crock-potting it. It's a slow cooker, isn't it? What I'm saying is, yeah, this is, this is an ongoing, everyday relationship with Jesus. It's following the Spirit today and tomorrow and the next day. And as we do that, that's how character grows. That's how you make the tree good. James wrote it this way, James 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Perseverance. What's perseverance? Stick with it. Stick with it. See, it's that, it's that long obedience in the same direction. It's not giving up. It's hanging in there. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. How do you get to be mature and complete? It's not microwaved. It's a crock pot. It's perseverance. It's that long obedience in the same direction. Keep on walking. Keep on following. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's that slow cooker that builds the character. To walk in the Spirit is to live all day, every day in His presence, engaged in relationship. And here's the big idea, friends. It's the relationship itself that changes us. Have you ever noticed how married couples that, that, that are married for a long, long time, they start talking like each other and acting like you ever? Have you ever noticed that? It's like the two really do become one. The question is, which one? But anyway, they're... But they become alike. Lane and I, uh, later this month, will celebrate our 47th anniversary. And uh, I just got to tell you something. 47 years of living with this woman has made me a much better person. It really has. Now, I wish I could say the same thing about her living with me. She kind of got the short end of that stick. Sorry, honey. If you want to be like Jesus, what should you do? Live with Jesus for a long, long time. Perseverance. Stick with it. You build thick faith 
And when you do that, you build strong and solid character. Paul ends 2 Corinthians with this prayer. He says, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, last verse of the book. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May you enjoy, he prays, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What's fellowship? It's friendship, it's partnership, it's close relationship. Close relationship with the Holy Spirit. Do you have that? Day in, day out, that's what changes us. The relationship is what changes us. So, fun story, when Lane and I were newly married, I was going through a little season where I was wanting to remind myself that God's with me, that I'm not alone. And uh, to do that, I just did, I did some simple little things. I would get up in the morning and to do my PBJ time, I'd pour myself a cup of coffee and then I'd pour Jesus a cup of coffee. And I'd go and I'd sit in a chair, little chair here, end table, couch, and I'd put my coffee here, I'd put Jesus' coffee right next to it on the end table. I imagine him sitting there on the couch and I'm sitting here in the chair. I'd read my Bible, I'd pray, I'd have a conversation with him. Now, Jesus never drank his coffee. <laughs> but I really was doing it, not, not, I knew he wasn't going to drink it, right? I'm doing it to remind myself. And then the next thing I did, I, I only did this, by the way, for just a short season, for a few weeks. But the next thing I did was when I got ready to go to work, I'd go out. We lived in a little apartment complex, and I mean, you stepped out the door, and there's the car, right? And I would walk out to go to work, and I would go first to the passenger side, and I'd open the passenger side door and let Jesus in, invite Jesus to go to work with me. Then I'd close the door, go around and get on the driver's side. Listen, there had to be people in our apartment complex who thought, that pastor is just bonkers, man. <laughs> well, as I said, I only did that for a little while. Uh, now, right now what I'm doing, and it's going off right now. My watch is giving me an alarm right now. It's 10.02. And uh, this is my, my regular daily alarm at 10.02. It's for Luke 10.2. Luke 10.2 says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. And so every day, 10.02, my watch beeps, and I stop and I pray that prayer. Lord, send workers into the harvest. Hear my Lord, send me... But in stopping and praying, I also remind myself, the Lord's with me. The Lord's with me. Now, why do I do that? Why do I use little reminders like this? Because, friends, it's too easy to live like a Christian atheist. Do you know what I mean by that? To be Christian in name, right? I'm, I'm, and I am. I'm truly Christian. But to go through my day as though God's not with me. Imagine this. Imagine if I came to hang out with you for a day, spent the whole day with you, right there by your side, and you never once spoke to me, never once acknowledged my presence, never even looked at me. It was as though I weren't there at all. How weird would that be? That'd be weird, wouldn't it? But that's Christian atheism, right? That I am a Christian, I love Jesus, but I go through my whole day without talking with him, without acknowledging that he's there, without stopping to recognize his presence. And it's really easy for me to do that. And it's the relationship that changes us. And that's why I have these little reminders to remind me, I want to be more like Jesus. To do that, I need to walk in the Spirit, follow the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. It's a relationship, and I want to cultivate the relationship, and I want to do it for a long, long time. Because character is a crockpot. The second thing someone down here mentioned that all these verbs have in common is they're all moving. Walk, follow, keep in step. There's nothing static about the Christian life. It's about following Jesus. We say this all the time. You can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. Isn't that true? I mean, if you're following, it implies movement. You can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. So I'm inviting you, friends, to an adventure. I'm inviting you to the adventure walking with the Spirit every day, day after day for the rest of your lives. And that's what's going to grow this character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control doesn't happen overnight, but it happens as we walk in the Spirit for a lifetime, this lifetime of relationship. So I'm going to give you a specific assignment this week. Here it is. I'm going to encourage every one of you to set a reminder. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your watch. I have some friends who write notes on their, the back of their hands. 
You know, you can get a Sharpie and write yourself a little note. If you don't want to mess up your skin, do that to your spouse. Write a note on their hand where you'll see it. But the idea is set some kind of a reminder for yourself so that each day you'll have just a moment where you pause and remember, you're here, Lord. And today I'm walking with you. I'm following you. And I'm going to actually give you a prayer to pray. It's a very simple eight-word prayer. Ready? Here it is. By the way, it's at the bottom of your outline as well. The very bottom. So you can take it home with you. But here it is. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Melt me, mold me. We're asking the Spirit to change us, to make us more like Jesus. Fill me, use me. We're asking the Spirit to empower us, to give us the gifts to do God's work. Again, it's not either or, it's both and. So here's what we're going to do. Some of you will recognize that prayer coming right out of an old song we used to sing. We're going to sing this song right now. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. We're going to sing it as a prayer, and then we're actually going to take a few moments, and I'm going to lead you step by step through those four requests. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. And then we'll sing it again to close. Sound good? Okay. Sing with me, would you? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Sam plays that. We're going to just pray that prayer. First one, melt me. Melt me. Did you know that when they were refining gold, they superheated it, they melted it, and the impurities rose to the surface and were skimmed off? And that's what we're praying. Melt me, Lord. Take away my pride, my stubbornness, my disobedience, my resistance. Melt me. You take a moment and just pray that. Invite him to melt you, to work in your life. Spirit to shape us, to form us in the image of Jesus. Now that we're soft, melted, pliable, Jeremiah actually used that image. He said, God is the potter, you're the clay. And God said, won't you be soft, pliable in my hands? Let me shape you. Would you pray that prayer with me right now? Mold me, Lord. Make me like Jesus. my life, Lord, surrender to you. You're shaping me, making me like Jesus. You're gifting me, empowering me. Now send me, Lord, into the world to represent you and to do your work. Use me, Lord. Would you pray that prayer with me? Use me.
sculpt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Sing with me, would you? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, melt me, melt me, mold me, fill This is our prayer today, Lord. But not just today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, each day. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Make us more like Jesus. And help us, Lord, stay in the crock pot. Sometimes we get discouraged, frustrated, sometimes we want to bolt and run. Help us to persevere, to stick with it, knowing that it's the relationship that changes us. Let it happen for each of us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.